going to really be focusing on what are the changes in DSM-5 and what's behind them. You know, why has, has there, have there been such large changes? What are they going to mean to your practice? What we're really hoping is going to happen is that we're going to take you from this state of being, which is how I felt, certainly when it came out and when I got asked to give this presentation, um, to this state, which is how I'm feeling now that I've actually processed it quite a bit and I'm feeling a little bit reassured about the contents. So I hope we'll get there today. All right, before we really jump into the changes though, I wanted to give you a little bit of background about DSM-5 or DSM in general, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual that will help you understand how psychiatric nosology and classification has changed because the way that we think about psychiatric disorders really is quite different now than it was um, earlier in, um, in our field. And actually, by the way, I wanted to mention one other thing here. Like I say, I'm giving Sally Rogers talk for her, and she has a copyright on these. She put this on herself. So I'm just noting that um, and also thanking and acknowledging her for sharing these slides with me and with us, all of us. Okay, so how did we get here? Well, first in general, what is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual meant to be? And this isn't just DSM-5, it's, it's all of the iterations of it. Um, it was originally designed for an audience primarily of physicians, particularly because back in the 40s and 50s when they were developing this manual, that's who did most psychiatric diagnosis. And it was meant to be used um, the way that physicians saw patients, so not with psychological testing, not with big multidisciplinary evaluations. Um, it was meant to be done through an interview that might be rather short, um, depending on you know, how, how that clinician practiced, and certainly now it would be rather short. Um, and so it, it isn't something that is going to map on directly to any particular measure or any psychometric testing, and I think that's a really important point for us to make. Um, and so the other piece of it, though, even way back in the 1950s, is that it was meant to reflect current scientific knowledge, okay? And that has changed a lot over the last 60 years. So DSM-1, they just called it the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, didn't get the Roman numeral one until later, um, first came out in the 1950s. Prior to that, psychiatric diagnosis was absolutely subjective. There were no criteria. So obviously things were, um, could be quite unreliable. You could go to one person, get one diagnosis, somebody else would give you a different diagnosis. And that makes sense if nothing's written down about what defines any particular condition. Um, in fact, even in DSM-1 and 2, there were still no operational criteria. In fact, they were just paragraphs that sort of described the condition, but it never said you had to have, you know, three out of this list and two out of that list, and it didn't have even any itemized, operationalized criteria. That first came in DSM-3 in 1980. Um, and then there have been other revisions along the way. And in general, what the revisions aim to achieve is to, number one, incorporate new research findings, things that we didn't know in the earlier version and now we realize are inaccurate, misleading, unhelpful. And secondly, there are a lot of redundancies um, and overlap across both conditions and within conditions. I'll talk about them very clearly or I hope clearly soon, um, but these kinds of overlaps really contributed to a lot of unreliability of diagnosis. So that, it, um, you know, if you had symptoms that could be found in condition A and in condition B's criteria, then if a person went to see one clinician, they might get one diagnosis and they might get a different diagnosis from another clinician. So that's really the goal of all the DSM iterations is to tighten up, um, eliminate redundancies, and increase reliability. The very earliest viewpoints of the DSM were that we were dealing with really discrete, distinct conditions that had very clean boundaries. Um, I just put OCD here, but we could have listed all of the other disorders, because that's how they viewed it, is just each set of disorders was its own category with really no overlap between them, and that by understanding what the symptoms were and the causes and the treatments, that you would clearly be able to put any individual into a category because those sets of symptoms and causes and treatments were distinct for each one. 
However, we now know that is definitely not true. Um, and there has been a lot of this research done even in the past 20 years that really helps us understand that that categorical way of thinking isn't um, probably correct. So there are fuzziness, there's fuzziness of the boundaries in both behavior and in biology. So it turns out there are a lot of symptoms that are shared across diagnoses, um, attention problems, affective instability, um, language delay, you know, lots of things like that occur across many different conditions. Conditions co-occur together, they're comorbid, um, so you often see people in clinic who don't just have one easy set of symptoms, they have a whole bunch of things and they're going to need to have multiple diagnoses to really describe all the things going on with them. Um, at the biological level, we know that some of the same genes contribute to different diagnoses. So they don't seem to be distinct. This gene causes bipolar disorder. This gene causes attention problems. That there's overlap even at the level of etiology. We also know that symptoms and diagnoses change over time and with age. Um, again, reflecting sort of a continuum. If these were really completely separate, why would you move from one category to another in five years, right? And then we also know, finally, for pretty much all categories of the DSM, that the continuum that there is this continuum and it goes into normal. It's not just a continuum with other diagnoses, but the fact is many of us in this room will have versions of symptoms um, in a lot of different categories, but just possibly much milder. They're not impairing, so they're not considered symptoms, but the behavior is on the same continuum. All right, and so now the way that we think about many, many disorders in the DSM is sort of these quantitative differences or dimensions rather than categories. And so we have sort of, a, here's the normal curve and we have dimensions of, let's say this is eye contact, for example, or conversational ability. There's a continuum of it from really great to really impaired and somewhere we cut that line and say this is ASD above it but we know that there's all this other variation even below it within the normal range. So one of the biggest goals of DSM-5 for all the different categories, not just ASD, was to reflect this better understanding now of the dimensionality of psychiatric disorders. So who made the revisions? Um, it was a really diverse work group made up of people from many different disciplines, both scientists and clinicians. Um, it wasn't just researchers, as well as advisors from a, a variety of disability advocacy groups and um, related disciplines like the, you know, the Rett Disorder Foundation and th things along those lines, the Autism Society of America, et cetera. So they had very broad um, coverage of disciplines and input from lots of different fields. It was a four-year process. Um, they met by phone twice a month and then um, annually, or twice annually, I believe, for four, for four years. They had members from not just the United States, but also Canada and the United Kingdom. Um, and it was a really transparent process. I, I don't know how many of you were aware, but they posted every single draft of the criteria on their website, the American Psychiatric Association's website, and there were places for commentary. I don't know, did anybody ever leave a comment in here? Good, I did like four times. <laughs> uh, so it was great, you know, it really seemed transparent. It seemed like they wanted input. Um, and Dr. Rogers, again, whose slides these are, she's on, she was on the work group, I wasn't. Um, I was an advisor to it, but that was different. Um, she was on the work group and she said that they read every single one of the comments. There were thousands and they brought them to those, those phone calls and went over them and tweaked criteria here and there. So, um, and then as we'll get to talking about, they tested it um, in field trials and simulations, and we're going to talk about the results of those. All right. Now, all the work groups, there were 13, by the way, and we're just really concentrating on the one that dealt with autism, um, but all the work groups were given some guidance to go forward. They were told first off, you know, do no harm, and every time you make a change, think about how is this going to affect patients, and would it affect them in a a negative way, specifically. They wanted the criteria to um, 
not require any particular instruments or measures to be given, you know, that it needed to be useful for making um, a diagnosis in a regular office visit. They were told not to nitpick, to make meaning, clinically meaningful changes, sort of broad strokes, no little tiny details. But if there was a change, and therefore it was probably going to be a rather large change, they had to have very good research support for why um, they wanted to change it. All right, and they had two sort of fundamental starting points that the work group all agreed upon before they even began the process. The first is that they wanted um, this new category, or this new diagnosis, I should say, autism spectrum disorders, to involve both social communication symptoms and repetitive behaviors. Um, the thinking of this is this is how Kanner first described it back in the 40s. This is the sort of fundamental notion, the essence or the core of what ASD is, that it requires both social communication and repetitive behaviors. Now this has been somewhat controversial. We're going to talk about why, um, but this was basically a starting point and an absolute for the work group. And then secondly, they wanted to make it very clear that what they were defining, because again, we talked about this being on a continuum with normal, right? What they're defining is a significant disability, that they're going to figure out sort of where to draw the line by where this is causing impairment, functional impairment in the person's life. Um, this isn't meant to be used for a personality style or just some sort of quirk or traits um, that are a little bit unusual. It's supposed to impair the person's functioning for a diagnosis. All right, so let's walk through the changes and um, talk about their rationale. This is only a summary slide, um, but we're going to talk about eight um, different changes to the criteria, one by one. Okay, so the first one is that it has a new name. Um, it used to be called pervasive developmental disorders, I'm sure everyone's aware, and now it's called autism spectrum disorder. Now this is probably the least controversial of the changes and also highly welcome. Um, it was already in very popular usage. I'd heard parents using it 15 years ago, 20 years ago, not even a year past the publication of DSM-4, people were already saying what a bad title it was, it didn't make very clear that it had anything to do with autism, for example. So um, this one is, is very well embraced. All right, the second change um, is that now we have a single diagnosis called autism spectrum disorder, and it has no subcategories. So the sort of previous state in DSM-4 was that we had a category called PDDs, and there were five types of PDD um, and different criteria for each one. Now, however, um, four of those five are all being subsumed into one diagnostic label called autism spectrum disorder. Now, RET disorder is removed, and there is a reason for that, a very good reason, and the, the main reason is because we now have a biological test, a molecular test for RET, RET disorder. Um, we don't need behavioral criteria for it. So if you look at the DSM and all the iterations back of it, um, it's for conditions that have a behavioral phenotype um, and can only be diagnosed through that behavioral phenotype. So we didn't ever have criteria for Down syndrome, for example, even though that does have a behavioral phenotype, um, but we don't need to check the behavioral phenotype to decide if the person has Down syndrome. We just do the molecular test, and that's now the case for Rett syndrome. The um, gene, the mutation of the gene on X chromosome was discovered in late 90s, I would say 99 maybe, something around there. So that's been removed, and the other four are now all subsumed into autism spectrum disorder. All right, why? <laughs> this has been a controversial decision, um, but it was backed up by a lot of research evidence. Um, so let's walk through some of that. Um, there's quite a lot of evidence that this is really one spectrum, autism spectrum, rather than four disorders. One is that um, th at least these three, autism, Asperger's, and PDD-NOS, and maybe 
childhood disintegrative disorder, um, clearly do share a common genetic basis. Um, in monozygotic twins, it's very common for one twin to have Asperger's syndrome. The other one could have very severe autism and to have even very low correlation between their IQs and their severity levels. So we know that in people who share the exact same genes, there can be differences in which category of the DSM-4 they fell into. So they, they share a common genetic basis. That's very clear. It's been clear for actually quite a long time, since studies in the 80s. Um, several studies have found that there are really very few differences at the brain level, in fact, almost none, when you look at, say, a child with Asperger's syndrome and children with autism of similar IQ level, their brains look just the same. Um, and then finally, the diagnostic picture often changes over time. So many children um, will initially get diagnosed if they're very young with maybe PDD-NOS. Maybe they don't show all the symptoms yet or a clinici clinician has felt um, a little uncomfortable with giving the full diagnosis at, in a two-year-old, but they come back at three or four, then they get autistic disorder, and then as they improve with treatment and over time, they come back at eight, and then they get a diagnosis of Asperger's disorder. So again, that doesn't sound like categories. That sounds like a continuum, right? Why would they jump categories with these really clean boundaries and have their entire, you know, the, the boundaries were meant to even suggest that those had different causes. And so there just isn't good evidence of that to be the case. Now, put this in quotes, removing Asperger disorder has been the most controversial, um, potentially across the entire DSM-5. Um, it generated so many newspaper articles um, and lots of parents very worried about it, legitimately, about what the consequences might be for their children. So, um, you know, why did they do this in particular? I mean, could they have just had left two categories, for example, autism and Asperger's? Um, why didn't they? Well, first let me remind you of what the dsm 4 criteria were for Asperger disorder, and then I'm going to sort of pick it apart because it's extremely problematic. Um, but basically, children had to have at least two symptoms from the social set, um, one repetitive behavior symptom, had to cause clinically significant impairment. Okay, we're agreed on all that. Um, it also is supposed to cause no clinically significant delay in language. That's very, very hard to measure because many times children are coming in for a potential diagnosis of Asperger's when they're seven, eight, nine, um, you know. Most parents couldn't remember exactly, did the child have single words by two and phrase speech by three? It was quite imprecise, so that was one that was hard to measure. Um, no clinically significant delay in cognitive functioning, okay, we're pretty on board with that, um, but adaptive functioning, I don't think I've ever seen a child with Asperger's syndrome who has no delay in adaptive functioning. If you applied that criterion, probably nobody would have ever been diagnosed with Asperger's. Most people actually ignored it. And then finally, um, what they call the precedence rule is that you could not meet criteria for autistic disorder. So in other words, autistic disorder took precedence over Asperger's. If you met criteria for both, which could happen, this is again problematic, then you're supposed to give the diagnosis of autism. And it turned out multiple studies, four or five different studies showed that if you very, very carefully applied all these criteria, the proportion of children who would come in, who would actually really meet for that diagnosis was tiny, way, way smaller than who were actually getting diagnosed. Um, it's also the case that it was being used really, really differently um, across clinicians. So people, given the problematicness of the criteria, were basically just deciding, in a way, if they thought the child felt more Asperger-y versus more autistic, right? Um, and, and I even, I didn't do that in clinic, but I mean, I would often say he's an Asperger type. You know, there was a feel of what that was like. But it wasn't being followed, really, the criteria, so it did mean that it was very unreliable. Kids could definitely go to one clinician and get a diagnosis of high-functioning autism and another one and get Asperger's. That happened all the time. In fact, I would tell people in my clinic, don't be alarmed if this happens. It doesn't mean he got worse or something or I was doing it wrong or the next person's doing it wrong. It's just a not a reliable diagnosis. Um, and I actually already covered most of this, but the genetic and neuroscience research, 
autism compared to Asperger's, very, very few differences, and that was also true in cognitive research when they would um, get a sample of kids with autism with similar language levels as Asperger's, you know, match on, on language, they wouldn't find any differences in memory, in motor, in executive function, in, you know, any area they looked at. So I think the real kicker here is that if these are really the same condition, but if you happen to get that label instead of that label, you don't get any services, that is patently unfair. Absolutely, right? I mean, it was unfair anyway, but if it's the same condition and you just happen to go to somebody who gave you the one that's not going to get served, that is, is really a problem. And, I, and the working group very much recognized that as well. Um, so wanted to, again, reflect the dimensionality of this, not categories. All right, well, what about PDD-NOS? Even more problematic, probably. Um, first of all, it didn't even have its own operational criteria. It was just a default category. So if you didn't meet any of the other four diagnoses, you could get PDD-NOS as long as you had at least two symptoms. And one of those had to be social. But of those two symptoms, they could both be social. You could have social and communication. And in communication, it could just be delayed language. Now, delayed language is a really nonspecific symptom. So you have delayed language and some trouble with peers, PDD-NOS. Well, that's like a lot of kids who have ADHD, learning disabilities, random children. So it really was resulting in a lot of misuse. Um, it, first of all, even though it was a default category, got diagnosed more often than either of the ones with operational criteria. And secondly, the field trials, which were done in the 90s, um, these are where they test out criteria and see how well they're working, showed that um, I believe it was 40% of children with PDD-NOS clinical diagnoses did meet criteria for PDD-NOS, um, but that of the other 60%, 30 actually met criteria for autistic disorder. So these children were being sort of underdiagnosed, particularly if they lived in a state where PDD-NOS didn't get services. Um, and then the other 30% weren't even on the autism spectrum. They essentially had like ADHD with language delays and things like that. So it's always, in my opinion, long before DSM-5, been a suspect diagnosis that if a child came in with it, we always, as a matter of course, re-looked at it and made sure it was accurate. All right, um, maybe you're already all convinced, but I'm gonna tell you one more really interesting study that I hope is the nail in the coffin for you. Um, there was this really great study that was done um, in, it was published in 2012 in the Archives of General Psychiatry by Dr. Kathy Lord. She is the developer of the ADOS and the ADI. And she um, pulled together a group of 12 autism research centers. So these are people who were already filled with experts who really knew how to diagnose autism spectrum disorders. And they recruited over 2,000 children across these centers um, from 4 to 18 years old, made sure that they all met criteria on gold standard instruments for ASD. Um, and then she provided lots and lots of additional training on the ADOS and the ADI. They were already trained, but then they had to go through this repeat training so that they became real, real experts, and then she let them loose and said, okay, what's your clinical best estimate diagnosis of these kids at each site? And so um, let me walk you through this slide. It's a little complicated at first, but worth understanding. Each column is a site, so these are 12, the 12 sites. And within the column, the three colors represent the proportion of children at that site who are diagnosed with autism, PDD-NOS, or Asperger syndrome. Okay, now remember, all of these kids are verified to be on the spectrum somewhere and to meet ADOS and ADI criteria, and they're seen by experts. But look at the tremendous variation across sites in the proportions. Okay, this site diagnosed every single kid they saw with autism. Nobody had PDD-NOS or Asperger's in Kansas or wherever that was. We, I don't know which site that was. Okay, but in this site, 50%, only 50% had autism, and then 45% had PDD-NOS. Or look at the Asperger's range. You know, it goes for anywhere from 20, almost 25%, these sites, to zero or one or two percent. And so the question is, is there really that much regional variation? You know, is there that much difference between New York and Kansas in the rates of Asperger's and the rates of PDD-NOS? Um, or is it something else? And so they took a look at that. 
Well, it turned out that the participants did not differ across sites. They had the same levels of IQ. Mean IQ did not differ across sites. They had the same ADOS scores across sites, mean levels. Okay, so that couldn't account for it. It wasn't like they just happened to get a really high functioning sample at one site and a really lower functioning at another site, et cetera. It wasn't in the kids, basically. What they found is that site was the strongest predictor of diagnosis um, after ADOS and IQ scores were pulled out of that site. Nothing about the child. So if the child had a low IQ or a high ADOS score, they got the diagnosis of autism. And then after that, all the rest of the variation was just by sight. In other words, by sort of the clinician patterns that they, you know, how they use those diagnoses. So the take home point really for this study is that the clinicians agreed on the symptoms. They agreed on severity. They agreed on scores on the ADOS. They agreed on IQ. What they didn't agree on was subtypes. That's it. And so if there isn't another good argument for why we didn't need subtypes, I don't know what one is. But anyway, so that to me um, has been very helpful to really think through what the research is behind putting these all in one category. All right. Um, the, next set, the next change is that we now have two symptom sets instead of three. In DSM-4, there were social, communication, and repetitive behavior symptoms. And now in DSM-5, there's just two. Social communication got lumped together and repetitive. This was not only based on a lot of factor analyses, so data analyses showing that those symptoms clustered together, but also the fact that it was always very hard. I always felt like there was a lot of redundancy between those two sets of criteria because communication is inherently a social act. You don't you can't commute, you can talk to nobody, but you can't communicate to nobody else. You have to do it to somebody. So those had a lot of overlap, as we'll see soon. Um, also, another really big change is that they make an explicit statement now in DSM-5 that some of the symptoms may be shown by history. Um, and it says it right there. Now, DSM-4 was sort of agnostic on this. It just didn't say it anywhere. Um, it didn't say it could be by history or it could not be by history. It had to be current presentation. It just didn't say. Now it says symptoms can be met by history, too. Um, and that will have a big impact. Fourth change is now there's a consolidated symptom list. There used to be 12 symptoms, now there are seven. All right, we're gonna spend some time on this. So in the DSM-4, just to remind you, there were these 12 symptoms, four each in the three core domains, um, and you had to have at least two social symptoms, one communication, and one repetitive behavior symptom. And if so if you did the math then of all the different possible ways you could get to having an autistic disorder diagnosis, it was 2,688 combinations could lead you to getting a diagnosis of autistic disorder. And as you're going to see in a moment, there was huge overlap among these symptoms. Um, so they wanted to refine the symptom list. DSM-5 now um, has seven symptoms, and you need to show at least five of them. So you need to show all three of the social communication symptoms and at least two of the repetitive behavior symptoms. Um, I want to point out this. Uh, if anybody's done a detailed reading yet of the DSM-5, it's ambiguous. In fact, there seems to either be an error or an omission from the draft criteria to the published text. Um, but in, I, I wrote it down, let me find it. But in the um, book, it actually says something like, um, as manifested by the following, and then it lists those three symptoms. And I think what it, so it says, as must show you know, pervasive impairments in social communication as manifested by the following, and then it lists these three things. Um, and of course, what most people think it should say is as manifested by all of the following. And so potentially that will get changed in the next iteration. But I've talked multiple times to people on the work group and you know, people in charge of the DSM-5, and I can tell you with, with confidence that it, it, it is meant to be all three symptoms, okay? So they need to show all three. So if a child only showed two social symptoms and some repetitive behaviors, they would not meet criteria for an autism spectrum disorder and it would not get diagnosed. All right, now what I'm gonna do is show you how these things map on. So what I have over here are the DSM-4, eight, um, eight symptoms from social and communication and how they map onto the new three DSM-5 symptoms, all right? 
Um, some of them are really straightforward. In fact, I'm not going to really comment on each one because we'll run out of time, number one. Um, but some of them are just obvious um, where, where they go. So this, you know, nonverbal behaviors, nonverbal behaviors. So that one is an obvious map, right? Um, the peer relationships one goes down here with relationships. Um, sharing of enjoyment is mentioned clearly um, in the descriptive material for this symptom, deficits in social emotional reciprocity, not sharing, showing, pointing, etc. And then lack of social emotional reciprocity obviously fits under that one. It's practically phrased the same. Now let me point out one thing that is really different. Look at these. Market impairment, failure to, lack of, lack of. Okay, that's a dichotomy. You, if you had none, Great, you can meet the symptom. If you had some, well, gee, should I say that they have lack of social emotional reciprocity if they have some reciprocity, but it's sort of impaired? So these were not well phrased, frankly. These are all continua, deficits in. So it gives you the sort of latitude to show different degrees of impairment, not just having to have none of it. Frankly, even very severely affected children with autism rarely had lack of reciprocity, you know, zero. Okay, so now let's go here um, to the communication. I'm gonna skip this one for a moment. We'll come back to it. The conversational one, um, this was basically a reciprocity symptom. Conversational reciprocity goes there. And um, lack of spontaneous make-believe play is mentioned as one of the symptoms that can meet these criteria in the text. But I did skip two right here. Delay in development of spoken language is not, does not have a counterpart in DSM-5. And they actually took it out explicitly because it's extremely nonspecific. It was one of the most nonspecific symptoms. It didn't really help you nail down a diagnosis of ASD because, or, or autistic disorder because kids in, with lots of other conditions show language delays. So that is removed. Um, and then the other one, stereotyped or repetitive or idiosyncratic language actually falls now under the repetitive behaviors. So let me switch gears to that. All right, so I've moved that over a column. So here's that last communication symptom that we had to find a home for, and it's now up here, stereotyped or repetitive speech. So they took it from the communication domain and moved it into the repetitive behavior domain. Again, what they're trying to do is cluster like with like so that there's not this redundancy. Actually, I wanted to say something back on, on this slide, um, which is just to note, look, we have three different symptoms that all measured reciprocity in DSM-4. It's redundant. You know, if you have one, you're going to likely have two or even three. One was sort of reciprocity of attention. <coughs> and one was general reciprocity or emotional reciprocity, and one was conversational reciprocity. So they just put them all together. Now we have a reciprocity symptom. Any of those can be examples of it. All right, so let's move, keep going through the repetitive behaviors. Very straightforward, fixations and fixations, routines and routines, motor mannerisms and motor mannerisms, and then preoccupation with parts of objects is um, also stereotyped or repetitive use of objects fits there, that lining up and things like that. So you can see that 11 out of the 12 DSM-4 symptoms are well accounted for in DSM-5, so they'll sort of count or they'll transfer pretty easily. And in addition, we have a new symptom that they added. And this was, again, one of those research-based decisions. There's a lot of solid research showing that between 70 and even some, some studies have shown 90 percent of children um, with ASD have some of these either sensory sensitivities or sensory interests, you know, so they can be either bothered by, um, bothered by tags or textures, or they can be very interested in textures or sounds or the visual look of something. So that's been added. All right. In addition, within the consolidated symptom list, they now describe the symptoms dimensionally. And this is a really important point, too, that I'm going to belabor a little bit. Um, but in the DSM-5, for each of the symptoms, it will say deficits in social emotional reciprocity as manifested by, and then it just gives some examples with a colon and a few lists of things in the criteria. 
So these are really a dimension. It goes from really severe versions of social emotional reciprocity, like a child who doesn't initiate or respond to things, that's a very extreme version of reciprocity, to a very mild version of reciprocity where um, they might just have awkward approaches to people or they just might have trouble with conversation. Um, you don't have to show all three of these. In fact, the way they're written, it would be extremely unlikely to show all three. You, just have, you might have to show one, but it makes it very clear, too, in the text. You don't have to show any of those three. You, there could be other reciprocity problems that the child shows. And I will call your attention to the text, because in the text, it gives multiple other examples that can be used to illustrate this particular behavior, or all of, actually all seven of the behaviors. So it gives three right in the criteria, but they're just meant to be examples. You can come up with your own examples of reciprocity problems, and then you can also look in the text. So for example, in the text for um, this reciprocity symptom, I quote from here, under the diagnostic features it says, this symptom may also be evident as reduced imitation, language that is used primarily to label rather than to comment, um, not knowing, or no, sorry, knowing what not to say in a conversation, trouble processing social cues, etc. okay? So it's very clear if you read the text that these are just some examples, um, and there's more that they give you and then others that you could use yourself, I think, to fit. So it's a dimension, though. There's lots of different ways you could um, get this symptom ticked off, right? Same for nonverbal behaviors. It goes from you know, very severe versions to very mild versions. And same with the relationships one. Um, this used to be concentrated really just on peers in DSM-4, but now it's been brought into all developmentally appropriate relationships, which would include for young children their parents and siblings and others like that. And again, very severe version versus a mild version, difficulty adjusting behavior to the context. Okay, so really quite broad for each of these. Um, and we have the same in repetitive behaviors where they give a bunch of different examples. Here you can see they've included speech, like I called out before, echolalia would come under repetitive behaviors now. Um, sameness, again, it's not just routines. Now they talk about greeting rituals, rigid thinking, or things like that, trouble with transitions, distress at small changes, all of that now gets captured. Before it was just if you had routines or rituals. Um, they also have added a sort of more severe version of a highly restricted interest. This used to just be a high functioning symptom. You know, the kind of kid who would go on and on and on about Scottish clan tartans or something like that. <laughs> um, but now it can also include strong attachment or preoccupation with unusual objects. So like the three year old who carries around the brick or the little tiny piece of string or, or whatnot. So again, they've tried to make this into a dimension. And then finally, multiple types of sensory issues. All right, the fifth change is that now we have to rate severity of the um, behaviors and of the symptoms. And in DSM-4, the way we actually denoted severity was by which diagnosis they got. So autistic disorder was the most severe, Asperger's may be the next most severe, PDD-NOS the mildest. Here, we don't have those distinctions anymore. The way we describe severity is in three levels. Um, and what's really great about this is it allows the child to keep the diagnosis even if they change severity levels, okay? So now, this table um, is in the DSM-5, and it lists three different levels of severity, a level one, a two, and a three. And they explicitly steered away from calling this mild severity, moderate, or severe, because they wanted it to be really clear that even at this level, that a child required support. So they're just saying, even at the level one, they need help. And then they give you some nice text-based examples that we're gonna try out in the workshop or in the interactive discussion following this, um, but about how to take your observations and map them onto a severity level for each um, of the two domains, social communication and repetitive behaviors. All right, there are other specifiers in addition to severity. We used to be able to describe sort of heterogeneity of a child with the multi-axial system and the axes in DSM-4 and 3. People didn't really use them that much, but to the extent they did, you could um, 
you could describe some of the ways in which a child or a, um, a group of children might be heterogeneous, and we can still do that um, systematically. So for each child, you're meant to tick off, are, do they have or not have intellectual impairment? Do they have or not have language impairment? Is this associated with anything medical or genetic, like fragile X syndrome or seizures? Um, do they meet criteria for any other disorders, like ADHD? And do they have catatonia, yes or no? Um, and this used to be a specifier in all the draft criteria, but it's been removed. So age of onset and course is where you would say if the child had had a regression, for example, when their onset started. Um, but they removed it. It's not clear if that's an error or not, and so I don't know if it will be back in the next edition or not, the revision. The sixth is that we can, the sixth big change is that we can now diagnose comorbidities, as you just saw on that previous slide, um, as a specifier. And the one I just want to mention that we're all most happy about, I think, is ADHD, because anybody who's seeing these kids realizes that a bunch of them had symptoms of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, but it used to be an exclusion in ADHD. If the child had autistic disorder, they could not be co-diagnosed with ADHD. And now that's been removed. In fact, there aren't any um, of those kinds of exclusions for ASD. So you can co-diagnose anything else that would be necessary to treat the whole child and to be sure that all their difficulties are being addressed. And then finally, uh, or no, not finally, almost finally, there is no age of onset criterion anymore. It used to be that you had to show symptoms prior to age three, and now it just says essentially that you have to show them at some point in early childhood, but it's possible that they won't even be manifest until, until for example, the child goes to school in a child with milder symptoms where you really need the peer group or sort of the unstructured hubbub of a classroom to really see some of the social deficits, the reciprocity issues and relationship issues pop out. So what happens if people don't meet these criteria? And that has been a big concern, and the working group knew that as well. So they've added a new condition, brand new, um, communication disorder called social, and in parentheses they put pragmatic, communication disorder. Um, they added the word pragmatic because pragmatic language disorders have been well known in um, you know, speech and language communities for a long time, never had a diagnostic home. So for all those children who previously could have gotten that diagnosis, they now have a place to get it. But this also is a place that children, for example, who might not meet ASD criteria anymore um, because they don't have any repetitive behavior symptoms will fit. And I'm not going to go through all the criteria here, um, but just to say that these focus on things that we all know and love and see in autism all the time. So difficulty using communication for social purposes, um, changing your communication to match the context, um, difficulty understanding rules of conversation like taking turns or nonverbal signals, and trouble with inferences or indirect language or ambiguous language. So those are the symptoms there, but then it specifically says not attributable to another condition, ASD, underline, underline, underline. So if a child meets criteria for ASD or even by history, for example, had repetitive behaviors, they actually can't get diagnosed with the social pragmatic communication disorder, then ASD is still the appropriate diagnosis. I want to point out also for people um, that on this is brand new from the draft to the published version of the DSM. On page 51, they added this statement. Individuals with a well-established DSM-4 diagnosis of autistic disorder, Asperger disorder, or PDD-NOS should be given the diagnosis of ASD. So that means if they're just coming back for a return visit or they're not getting re-diagnosed for any particular reason, just start using the new label. They used to have Asperger's, just call it. ASD, and that's what they're telling us they want us to do. However, for individuals who have marked deficits in social communication but don't meet criteria for ASD, read, don't have repetitive behaviors, then they should be evaluated for social pragmatic communication disorder. But I really think this, again, is very reassuring and helps us understand what the intentions of the DSM-5 were. It wasn't to reduce the number of diagnoses or make people ineligible. They just want you to transfer people over from DSM-4 to DSM-5, unless it was a child who maybe didn't 
meet really well, because PDD-NOS, frankly, was always um, a difficult label to use. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.